We met each other on the beach, coming into each other's lives in 1975. I remember the first time my eyes fell upon her. She was spread out on the sand, her beautiful curvaceous alabaster form barely visible through the early morning fog. I had waited for this moment for years, yet as I cautiously approached her, my heart began to race faster. My knees were shaking and suddenly I was wondering if this was such a good idea. She was my first. Our encounter was thrilling. Her curves and humps were glorious, yet her manner aggressive. It was a two-minute experience, brutal like an earthquake and cyclone combined. She shook and rattled relentlessly and screamed the wind, her fingers pulling back my hair. I was 14. She was 50. But I'm not talking about a woman. But that grand gateway to Mission Beach, that sculpture of wood then known as the earthquake roller coaster at Belmont Park. <laughs> Little did I know this was the beginning of a very long love affair. I'm a native San Diegan, uh, but my dad was in the Navy, so my earliest years were spent isolated from civilization on a remote island off of Alaska. I was also the only child who was very sheltered, so I was conditioned to be a loner and had a penchant for letting my mind wander. Instead of schoolwork, I'd be interested in drawing and making other things that I found to be of interest, like the Jupiter 2 from Lost in Space, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Mary Poppins. My C grades, my C minus grades, were a reflection of these obsessions. But in retrospect, they were man magical transports that could lift me up and away from that goddamn iceberg. I saw my first roller coaster on TV's The Partridge Family, and I couldn't wait to get back to the mainland and test my bravado. So anyway, we moved back to San Diego in 1974, and the next year, my eighth grade class took a field trip to Belmont Park, when it was much larger and boasted 25 rides and attractions. As I sat with a trainload of my screaming classmates, it was I who got the bug. Why? I, the skinny outcast who never fit in, always picked on for a joke, but never picked for basketball. I was sad to learn the park went bankrupt and closed at the end of 1976. All the rides were packed up and sold. The rest of the buildings were torn down and the roller coaster was left to deteriorate. In no time, neighbors in the area deemed it a dangerous nuisance, but the owner didn't think that he should be responsible for tearing it down. But soon, it was declared a landmark. In the 11th grade, I read an article where the death of the coaster seemed certain. I ventured out of my safe zone the next day by skipping school and took the bus 16 miles down to the beach for a little photo session. Just a few first and possibly last snapshots of the earthquake from outside the fence as a remembrance of the best ride of my life. I went home happy. I had a tangible memory, thinking my photos would come in handy if I ever wanted to memorialize her one day. Now I was a senior at Chula Vista High, class of 79, thinking that I was going to grow up to be an architect. Uh, I took advantage that the coaster was still occupying beach property, and this time uh, I chose to use it as a drafting project for class. Then I started to sneak on to the abandoned property by squeezing through a very slim gap under the fence and began to photograph, study, and measure the thing to find out what made her tick. Soon I was finding a way to work the coaster into all my class assignments. I got an A in drafting. The combination of the coaster's art and physics helped him improve my grades in math and history. For my film class, I made a killer ride recreation after I spent three afternoons scooting over every inch of track as high as 70 feet in the air. I got an A for that too. I did everything I could to try to recapture the memory of what it was like soaring over her hills so I could dream of riding her once again. As with any threatened landmark, some people wanted her saved. But that seemed more unlikely after she was set on fire twice inside one month. I was convinced that her days were numbered. Practically the next day, an odd stroke of luck landed me a job at a restaurant. Of all places, one on the boardwalk in Pacific Beach, only one mile north of the Dipper. This was perfect. Between school and the job, I could fit in an hour or two inside her with my vellum paper and scale ruler, in a way trying to look and feel official like I was her guardian. Her place became my home away from home, a sanctuary where there was no judgment. Each time I went, it was like visiting a ghost that told me stories through all the artifacts that I found every time I went there. 
I learned something new every day. I followed articles in the paper about redevelopment ideas for the area that ranged from keeping parts of her as a backdrop for a hotel to replacing her with a grassy park with trees. Back then, the notion that the earthquake could once again rumble was inconceivable. The one idea that I thought was lacking was turning the property into a family fun center with miniature golf, slides, and go-karts all going up into and under the idle coaster's framework. So passionate was I about my idea that I stood before the government nervous as hell alongside five other developers with their million dollar plans. I, in a gray suit that I had outgrown, presented my concept painted on a boaster board for only a total of like five dollars much to a sea of bemused expressions on the faces of the city council board, but I understood that I was 20 years old, but still looked like a teenager. All the developers' ideas were rejected, but I met a woman at that meeting who was a recently retired chairman of the Save Our Heritage organization. It had been suggested that a grassroots group be formed to at least study the feasibility of restoring the Giant Dipper. That was the first time I ever heard its original name. She invited me to one of the first Save the Coaster committee meetings in the fall of 1981. The small group of 10 was mostly made up of more historically preservation-minded people, but they found in me the blooming passion of a roller coaster enthusiast. A few months later, we put on a successful presentation before the city council. I was back up there, this time showing my film and the model that I made to showcase how nice the coaster could fit into any modern setting. By the end of that year, I was the owner of a roller coaster. For the next eight years, this was the place, thank you, this is the place where I belonged. We had hundreds of volunteer work parties and several fundraisers. We scraped paint, splashed on new, and hung the lights. During that time, we protected the landmark from greedy, insensitive developers still eager to seize her property. My favorite moments were getting to host famous roller coaster designers there to give us constructive tips and the day they filmed a scene from Top Gun next to our construction office where they used pages from my scrapbook as a last minute filler for a bulletin board. And the day a bunch of visiting roller coaster enthusiasts took joy rides on the old cars down the very old tracks. When it came time to restore her machinery, we were given the opportunity to hand the dipper over to a profit-based corporation based at the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. And they would take a uh, charge and invest in the project, thus completing the ride's full restoration with the intent to operate it. Impressed with my history, knowledge, and passion, the new San Diego Seaside Company hired me as their very first employee. I was made assistant manager and historical design consultant. That summer of 1990, I was so in my element. At the beach, directing several dozen construction workers as they spent four months sawing and hammering and bolting and painting that wonderful piece of art all back together. It was like watching my dream house being built before my eyes. In the middle of all that, a manager had been hired to be my new boss. He was to be in charge of operations, financials, as well as hiring the staff that was gonna be operating the coaster. Then, on the evening of a very long muggy day in August, I got to ride her again during test runs for the first time in nearly 15 years, and it was exhilarating. My spirits improved greatly. I had achieved immense success. A few days before the coaster's opening, we had an orientation day for all the new employees. These strangers who just seemed indifferent to the environment with the same kind of attitude that you would have showing up for jury duty. And that's when I started to become ill at ease. I sensed a change in the wind, and I did not like it. The dipper reopened to the public a week later, as I sat in the last seat of the inaugural train, <laughs> I was confused that I was faking my happiness, like a groom might do at his wedding reception when he realizes that he's not really in love. This was no longer my own private clubhouse. This became a job, and the time that I had proved to be most valuable was over. Now I was faced with the expected duties of being an assistant manager. Once the dipper reopened, I was in over my head because I had no training in business affairs, and I made a lot of mistakes. I went from roller coaster designer to training the food and beverage staff how to use a potato peeling machine. But the new manager was patient, and he was a great mentor. For the first couple of months, the giant dipper was raking in tons of money. So much, in fact, that my new boss was able to pilfer $11,000 in the first six weeks of ticket sales. 
he was promptly dismissed. The new manager was a born-again Christian, and I'm gay. <laughs> she did not have the same patience as my old boss for letting me, leading me through my new position. And while I kept my personal life as nobody's business, my association with a few members of a very large LGBT group who dropped in for a night of writing was picked up on by the staff, and soon there were rumors and speculations. And soon it was like being back at school when I was the subject of gossip and bullying and being mistreated. Eighteen months later, as the business expanded beyond the coaster, eventually came the day that I was squeezed out. I felt used and betrayed and ashamed. These days, I only go down there once in a while if there's an anniversary or a reunion. The Giant Dipper remains my personal success and a great reminder of my catastrophic failure. But the real irony is, as I stand and watch and listen to the screams of writers enjoying her thrills, I long for the days back when she was silent, the days when it was just us, the good old days when I only used to try to remember that experience, that thrilling wild ride that was my first. Thank you. Give it up for Tilton T-Square, everybody!